pagan Arabians believed that poets were people possessed by the jinn, which are usually malevolent spirits that haunted ruins and dwelt in rivers and oceans. The Arabs also imagined them in whirlwinds and water spouts. As we have shown in our four chapters, number 119, Muhammad loathed poets and denied any association or semblance with them for reasons that we shall demonstrate forthwith. In Muhammad ibn Ishaq's monumental biography of Muhammad, Sirat Rasulullah, translated by Alfred Guillaume as The Life of Muhammad, pages 71 to 72 and more on pages 106 to 153, we are informed on the authority of Halima, his suckling mother. Some months after our return, he and his brother were with our lambs behind the tents when his brother came running and said to us, Two men clothed in white have seized the Qureshi brother of mine and thrown him down and opened his belly and are stirring him up. We ran towards him and found him standing up with a livid face. We took hold of him and asked him, What was the matter? He said, Two men with white raiment came and threw me down and opened up my belly and searched therein for I know not what. So we took him back to our tent. My husband said to me, I'm afraid that this child has had a stroke, so take him back to his family before the result appears. So we picked him up and took him to his mother, who asked why we had brought him when I had been anxious for his welfare and desirous of keeping him with me. She asked me what happened and gave me no peace until I told her. When she asked if I feared a demon possessed him, I replied that I did. She answered that no demon had any power over her son, who had a great future before him. And then she told me how when she was pregnant with him, a light went out from her, which illuminated the castles of Busra and Syria. Even at the earliest stages of records building by his followers, the miracles that were not allowed for Muhammad in the Quran proliferated out of control in the subsequent 300 years with greater and greater myths turning Muhammad into an Allah-like God. Furthermore, on pages 106 to 153, it is related that Muhammad as a grown man was himself convinced of being possessed by evils and that accordingly, not to become the Quraysh village idiot, he tried to kill himself by throwing his body down a mountain. It is then said that Jibril Gabriel came to his rescue, but Muhammad still had doubts because the story did not end there. The vision repeated itself leaving Muhammad in an inner struggle about his own sanity. It is reported that he stood confused in the middle of nowhere until Khadija's messenger, his wealthy wife, found him on the high ground above Mecca, undecided about his own sanity. It was without a shadow of a doubt Khadija who first supported and soothed Muhammad in the crucial phases when he himself entertained the deepest doubts about his own sanity. Woe is me! Poet or possessed? asked her shaking husband. Khadija had to convince Muhammad by a test to verify if the entity appearing to him was indeed an angel or Satan. She asked him to meet her while the entity was appearing to him. When it came to be, she engaged into sexual preliminaries with Muhammad, asking at different stages if the entity was still there. It happened that in the process the entity left when the arousing got warmer, Khadija then said to him, O oh, son of my uncle, rejoice and be of good heart. By Allah, he is an angel and not a Satan. Her deduction was that Satan would not have left a sexual scene, but an angel would out of piety and chastity. Here we can clearly see that Muhammad's mission was never, ever confirmed by some godly signs with supernatural proofs, but merely by the strong will and intellect of his wife. There is absolutely no doubt, based entirely on the Muhammadan records themselves, that without the financial, spiritual and intellectual support of his wife, Khadija, Muhammad would have been an unknown total failure. For as long as Khadija was alive, her influence upon Muhammad was paramount, hence the delusions of Muhammad were under control. As a hermit dwelling in a cave, under the illusion of receiving messages, Nothing so far could make us believe that Muhammad was insane. In the language of psychiatry, his condition was stable, 
meaning he still could act like any normal person. Matters, though, worsened appreciably regarding both Muhammad's wealth and mental health, right after Khadija's death in 619 AD. On one more occasion only, that of the satanic verses, would Muhammad have doubts about his perceived divine mission. The abrogation of his blasphemous compromise by Allah was said to rectify the satanic revelation, showing without a doubt that Muhammad could not differentiate between Allah's and Satan's revelations. Clearly, as far as the Meccans were concerned, they thought that Muhammad suffered from some mental illness or ghost possession. They called him a dreamer, a fanciful poet, enchanted, like in the Quran 21.5, 36.69, 52.30. It was because they considered him mentally disturbed that they did not attempt to kill him, although he was insulting, denigrating, and humiliating their religion and traditions. To explain away his tribe's denial of him, with his usual dishonesty, Muhammad indulged in inserting in his Quran verses of contorted logic as he brings some non-existent alleged examples of biblical prophets likewise accused. Quran 51.52, 23.25, 26.26, and so on. As we have assiduously demonstrated in several of our chapters, Muhammad belongs more to the field of psychiatry than to the world of spirituality. The neuropathological foundations of his hallucinations are amazingly easy to identify. His acute megalomania comes from his desolate, shattered and unloved childhood in an overcompensating phenomenon. A narcissist is a person who has not received enough love in his childhood, who is incapable of love, but instead craves attention, respect and recognition. He sees his own worth in the way others view him. Without that recognition, he is a nobody. He becomes manipulative and a pathological liar. Narcissists are grandiose dreamers. They want to conquer the world and dominate everyone. Only in their megalomaniac reveries would they find their narcissistic supply. Their goals always have to do with domination, power, subjugation and respect. They wither and die if they are neglected. Narcissists often seek alibis to impose their control over their unwary victims. For Hitler, it was the party and race. For Mussolini, it was fascism or the unity of the nation against others. And for Muhammad, it was his cult belief system against all others. These causes are just tools in the hands of their manipulators in their quest for absolute power. Instead of promoting themselves, the narcissists promote a cause, an ideology or a belief system while presenting themselves as the only authority and representative of these causes and the only saviors of their people. Muhammad could not have asked anyone to obey him, but he could easily demand his followers to obey Allah and his messenger. Al-Tur 52.29 Therefore, proclaim thou the praises of thy Lord, for by the grace of thy Lord thou art no vulgar soothsayer, nor art thou one possessed. Or do they say, a poet, we await for him some calamity hatched by time. Al-Haqqa 69.41 it is not the word of a poet. Little it is, ye believe. al Ambiya 21.5 Nay, they say, these are medleys of dreams. Nay, he forged it. Nay, he is but a poet. Let him then bring us a sign like the ones that were sent to prophets of old. Al-Saffat 37.35 For they, when they were told that there is no God except Allah, would puff themselves up with pride and say, what? Shall we give up our gods for the sake of a poet possessed? Al-Duhduha, 93.3 .3. The guardian lord hath not forsaken thee, nor is he displeased. And verily, the hereafter will be better for thee than the present. And soon will thy guardian lord give thee, thou shalt well be pleased. Did he not find thee an orphan, and give thee shelter and care? And he found thee wandering, and he gave thee guidance? and he found thee indeed, and made thee independent. These verses reflect Muhammad's state of mind when he thought that his revelations had stopped. When they started again, he put up these verses reminiscing upon his orphaned and destitute childhood. 
Nonetheless, he added another one of his lies when asserting that Allah made him independent, when in fact he was totally dependent on his wife Khadija financially, intellectually and spiritually.